Hello again guys and uh, this is me leaving early morning, early bells from uh, uh, from Jain uh, on my way to Chichilla. I was actually, I actually took a uh, a long way. Uh, I ended up going to Shota um, up in the mountains uh, first. Uh, it turned out to be quite a uh, misadventure because it was just raining and uh, raining pretty heavy so I didn't get to see much on that journey and then I headed back so that took me about took me about an extra three hours of my journey to go on that route um, but I wanted to go up there and it was up quite up uh, pretty high up in the Andes and uh, uh, I think about 4,000 meters uh, um, that was the maximum height I got to um, but uh, it um, it was quite a uh, it's well, three thousand meters. I'm sorry. Um, so after after about after about uh, about 150 kilometers, about 100 miles. So I basically went uh, about 150 uh, 150 miles out of my way. Uh, up into the mountains, but it was well worth it. Uh, I had some glimpses of a, glimpses of sunshine, but for the most part, it was pretty. Uh, uh, it was pretty wet. Um, but this was the first transition day, where I went from you know the dense tropical forests and mountains uh, into deserts, um, and it's quite stark, and it happens fairly quickly. It's quite amazing how. The weather and um, over centuries, thousands of years, uh, the weather is reasonably consistent. You know that that it can create such parallels. You know between dense mountains. So it basically, it's you know you go from the dense and then it gets a little bit thinner, a little bit thinner and thinner and thinner. And this is over a you know 30, 40 mile period. And when basically, and then you're just basically in desert. Um, and so the weather, obviously the weather patterns over thousands of years play a role in that. And it's quite amazing that, that it's so steady. Um, obviously with, with uh, the changing climate um, that, that we're witnessing now and the, the build up of energy in the atmosphere, and things are changing quite rapidly, but still, it's still a, 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 a quite a, um, uh, quite a stark com uh, uh, difference between the two. Um, so on, to, on today's ride, it was it was going to be around about 400 miles total, and took me around 13 hours. So I didn't arrive till about 7 p.m. And I can guarantee you, I was absolutely exhausted. I actually thought it was going to take me around about 10 hours, but with the rain and then a little bit of off-road stuff. Um, the rain at one stage got so bad that I just had to park the bike on the side of the road because it was hitting my my helmet so strong I couldn't actually keep my head up to see um, where I was going because I just couldn't see anything. It was really, really heavy. Um, and then I, I got to Toto and then I then I turned back around. I had I had some uh, some breakfast there. Um, and I was able to get hold of a little roadside, uh, a little, a little, um, uh, little stall on the side of the road, which was pretty cool. And uh, they're pretty resilient, these people. <laughs> uh, still working in the rain and stuff like that. But um, I only stayed there about 15 minutes, had my bite, and, and then headed back because I really wanted to get out of the rain. I, you know, my helmet was all soaked inside. Um, and that was my fault because I had the, the visor up by out by about half an inch just to get some air in the visor. And it's the thing with the with the Shubeth B1 helmet, uh, you've got the sun visor on top. And um, I found out today once I started hitting the deserts and and with with all the deserts that I went through on this whole journey, the winds are unbelievable. So you can see there. That's the sort of thing you've got to deal with is cars overtaking other cars and, and your job, there's a policeman sitting by the side of the road, but your job is to get out of the way. It seems crazy, but by the time you start riding, you're alert to it all the time. 
you're always looking for it. And it's not every car that does it. it. And it's mainly buses, to be honest, people transporting other human beings. And it's no wonder that Peru has the worst uh, bus accident record in the world. I mean, just over the Christmas period, 40 people died. That's over a five, six day period, 40 people died. And now I've got a friggin' one of my worst things I hate more than anything else is people who use friggin' wind blo leaf blowers. They're completely useless. They make so much noise. They waste heck fuel. It, it's just such a ridiculous thing. I never get it. I never get why it's needed. All that they do is blow it to the side, and as soon as the wind blows, it blows up. It's basically to say, yeah, we, we made the, the lawns look good or the footpaths look good for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Give us your money. Ridiculous. Anyway, um, oh, okay, I'm going to stop. Yeah, so I'm oh, getting back on the Schubert helmet. So it's got this sun visor, and honestly, when the wind, I mean, the wind, it's very hard to explain, but basically, you could be just sitting there on, on the road, and the wind blows you so much that no matter what you do, the wind is going to blow you over the other side of the road. It, that's how strong it is. It is. It, it, ha it only happened once to me where I had no control. If it had been a car going the other way, because what I did was, I was you lean into the wind, so you're leaning your bike. In, in that case, I was leaning the bike to the right. So you're leaning over a few degrees to the right, uh, countering the wind. Um, and on this occasion, the wind just got so strong, I could not keep it. And as soon as the bike got upright, the wind was just pushing it to the other side. And basically, I just looked where I was what was coming and there was nothing coming and I just let it take me and then I fought back to my side of the road because there was nothing I was going to do, it was going to blow me over I'd blow me over, and I'd rather be in, have some sort of control over it, just incredible and because of that sun visor, that sun visor catches so much air I ended up taking it off pretty much after I got through in Patagonia and a couple of the trips here on the desert I just took it off and put it under my my tent in, uh, on, on my back case because it really hurts your neck as well with all that force and then taking it off immediately reprieves you. Um, so it's not the Shubeth uh, E1 Hunter helmet, fantastic helmet, but not good in wind with the sun visor on. Um, yeah, so the roads in Peru for the most part uh, on the major highways were good, but you always had, you just saw then those rock falls, they were everywhere. Uh, always you always saw that sort of stuff so um you always had to be vigilant and alert with that stuff uh, this this river here on the left this is on my way back um this river was just raging and uh it was uh i followed it along for maybe a hundred miles uh it was it was quite an impressive uh it was quite an impressive uh, uh river um I always wonder, there's no way no, anyone can ever swim in these things. I mean, they're going 15, 20 mile an hour, the water's flowing at, at, at quite a rate. So there's just zero chance. And then I always think of where can you fish? I mean, fishing in it would be nearly impossible as well. But there were certain parts where it, it spread out a little bit and there were some softer areas, but it's got that red, that, that brownish red uh, clay all through it. So I don't think too much would survive that well in that sort of water. It's not really, it's not that it's dirty water because it's all natural environment stuff. As you can see, look at the mountain ranges, spectacular, left, right, centre. Um, and again, even little towns like this will have those speed humps and they can be uh, quite challenging because some of them just seem to be man-made, like not actually sculpted, like slow, like slow moving, but friggin' hard and heavy and high, you know, yeah, the river's just just raging through there. So, I mean, the, the survival of the people who live around here is dependent on obviously electricity and also the, the water. Uh, I, I imagine they'd filter it quite, quite uh, strongly. Um, it's another thing I carry with me all the time too, is I ca carry some char a little charcoal bag. So just in case I've ever got to filter anything, I've got some charcoal around to do it. If you don't, you just got to light a fire, burn all the wood, um, and then you can put charcoal in a sock. You can put it, uh, I have it in like a strainer sleeve. Um, 
so it's all ready to go. And if you really do need to get some water, and it wasn't needed for me the whole trip, but if I ever needed to, I, I had that capability. Only weighs, you know, you know, 200 grams or something like that. You don't need a huge amount of it, but you need enough for it to capture any uh, any elements in the water. And, and if you're going to do it, um, the best way to do to do it is to continually filter. You know, filter once, filter twice, filter three times, and then you should be fine. Um, again, I've done it before where I've done some survival stuff, and uh, you you know, if you're ever going to get water from anywhere, make sure it's not still water. Make sure it's running water, like it's a flowing river. It's not you're not getting it from a still pool because that's where you'll get the bacteria and and uh, mosquitoes and things like that. Um, I'm a little bit lucky in, in that my, my body odour or whatever I've got going on sort of doesn't naturally attract uh, some mosquitoes. I was in, uh, in, uh, in Chile and uh, one of my friends was with me and he was like whacking his legs all the time. And I was like, nothing's touching me. <laughs> so maybe I'm just so, not even mosquitoes want to go near me. I smell that bad. So yeah, um, the, the riding today, although although wet, as long as you've got a good 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 solid road, you, 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 you're pretty fine. The one thing that does happen through Central and South American countries is, for some reason, they feel the need to paint corners. You know, so you'll in some places you'll get strips with warnings around a, around a corner, like every six feet, a, a, a one foot strip of paint, and that's just. That is just so bad. You know? I mean, you're basically going straight and then you're cutting right again, going straight because you don't want to go, you know, you don't want to end up sideways going over it because those things are slippery as all hell, especially when it's wet. There's another river running through a town. These little small towns are scattered throughout the joint. Usually there's not much going on in these little towns. Kids always playing outside and as you can see, he's got a barbecue running over there. It's always a teller, which is a mechanic. Uh, always, every single town has, even a town like this might have three or four mechanics. And all those writings on the walls and things like that, you see they're all, uh, they're all uh, political uh, writings. Some of them are really, really cool though. I took some photos along with some of them, some of them are pretty tacky. They had elections in 2016, so uh, some of them were getting a bit faded now. But uh, in some of the cities in Mexico, some of them just looks really cool, you know, really, really cool writing. So here you can start to see now how the transition is on going from the mountains with the with lots of trees to it's, it's thinning right out. And, um, and now we're into the plains now. Still a lot of mountains, but you're in, in, in the valley here and there's a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of uh, rice fields and things like that. Again, managing your fuel. Um, once you're below half full, you always fill up. You just get into a habit of doing that. You know, it's just it's just not worth it uh, trying to uh, trying to reach somewhere or hoping that there's a town that's going to have it. The, the, the fuel stations, well, there's quite a few. Um, start getting as you get further south from where I'm in Peru now as you keep going further south they get bigger and bigger distances between them Argentina was ridiculous um, I mean but there was because there were strikes on as well half the half the gas stations didn't didn't have any more gas left so they were waiting days so some of my friends had to wait a day or two um, in towns and, and stay in towns just because there's no gas and then once the gas station opens there's a line of three four hundred cars you know um, so yeah, so you can see down below there on the left, the river was it, it streamed out into about four, different, four or five different streams. It collects itself again soon enough. But it was just nice to get on to some some hard roads. I'm, I'm probably only doing about 100 k's an hour here. Um, I, I'm not going again. I'm not get, I'm not breaking any records. The only time I really went, you know, got up to was was consistently on 140. 150k an hour was in Argentina going back to Buenos Aires just to get because the roads were so boring from Patagonia to Buenos Aires the first couple of hours are okay and then after that it's just straight straight for about 3,000 kilometers 
So in Peru, you don't have to pay tolls. So you just weave your way through. Um, you don't have to pay uh, tolls in these in these countries. Um, so I just, you know, they just wave you through on the right side. Um, there's a bus crash there. Um, and that was from a while ago. The bus was pretty much stripped out. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and look, looking ahead now, you can see where we're getting from the, still some of these mountains here have got some trees on them, and then you get to the next, you get a little bit further down and there's just no trees on any of the mountains. It's quite spectacular. Um, but once you get into the sands, put that visor down, uh, get a, get yourself and your neck scarf on, because uh, otherwise your neck, if it's exposed, are going to hit by little particles all the time, and it can be quite painful. Um, but yeah, I, 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 had a, I mean, this is one of my favourite days riding, uh, just because the, the views were spectacular, and you'll see a bit later on some of the photography I got uh, on this trip. And I'm lucky right now because my tyre is no longer deflating and it didn't, it, it, my, my tyres were fine again until I got to, um, until I get to Santiago, Chile, where I get new tyres on and then that leak appears again. And unfortunately, the, the thing with knowing whether you've got a leak, you've got to do a long ride. Look at this, it's pretty spectacular here too. It's just the mountains and valleys. Awesome. And that's a dam, that one down there on the left. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, you don't know until you're doing progressive ride because air pressure depends, the air pressure in your tyre varies by three or four psi depending on how hot the tyres are. So first thing in the morning, my tyres should be around about 36 on the front and 42 on the rear. Uh, in the mornings, my tyres will be something like around about 34 on the front. Um, anywhere 32 if it's, if it's really cold and could go up to about 40 psi um, and so you, you know when I got my tyres in Santiago I had two days after I got my new tyres on and I couldn't tell any difference um, and I only did maybe about 30 40 kilometres of riding but it wasn't until I got on the road that it, and I wasn't thinking there'd be a problem with it but it wasn't until I got on the road again that I realised that it was leaking, albeit very slowly, it was leaking and, and my history, past history, told me that it's going to get worse and it did. And so it got to a stage where I was probably topping it up once every couple of days. It never got to a really bad stage again, but it got to the stage where every couple of days I was putting air in it. Um, so now look at this, it's just, it's just barren. Um, barren mountain ranges and this is pretty much all the way um, similar sort of scenery got a bit more trees down the road a bit further and a little bit greener but this is barren but it was still spectacular you know um, just beautiful beautiful and uh, <coughs> I had a gas station up ahead that I was going to be stopping at and um, I had there, there was one up ahead and then there was one another uh, 30 miles further past that so I had two options uh, it's you know as you get further south you only get up one option and you have to fill otherwise you're just going to run out of gas uh, so much fun twisties are just so much fun especially when it's dry <laughs> when it's wet you can't really do you can, you, you can still be reasonably aggressive, but just not too aggressive. Went through a few tunnels on this road as well, which was pretty cool. But very dry, you know, the, these sort of places don't get a lot of rain at all, but when it, when it does, it comes down, but they only get like uh, four or five days a year where it rains in some of these places. And all that water in the river below is all from further upstream where, the, where there is lots of rain. God, I miss this riding. It's amazing because we, 
where I'm from in Australia, there's also great roads, but all the new highways built are all just direct, straight and boring. Um, it's always better if you can is to get off and get onto the, in the US, get on the old highways. In Florida, you don't have a choice. But in, in, in California, Tennessee, um, and North Carolina, all those sort of places, there are other options. It takes you a hell of a lot longer, but who cares? It's so much more fun. I mean, even when, when I get a leave from Miami, um, when we go riding in Tennessee or North Carolina or any, any of those um, states, um, we, we hire a truck and a trailer and put our bikes on that. Because it, to get out of uh, Florida, it's about 14 hours of, of driving. And, um, and it's just all dead straight. So it's, and it's very dangerous. The, the people who drive on these on those roads are crazy, and you can't do 14 hours straight. Even though I've done, th I'll do 13 hours today. You can't do it straight on on a. I mean, 14 hour straight trip like in a car would take me on a bike 20 20 hours because you have to stop. You just can't keep just riding and riding. Number one, you've got to stop for gas. But number two is that you just get tired, and you and you and you get uh, you you don't get. Uh, you don't get lethargic, but you you will make you'll make mistakes. You know, um, you'll go into a corner too heavy because you weren't concentrating on what the signs were saying. Not that the signs in these countries give you any indication whatsoever of how tight a corner is. You know. Again, just spectacular scenery. It's a bit annoying being stuck behind a bus. I'm just waiting for a spot to overtake. No rush. So, those, the, the, so that's the arrows they'll have, and, and that'll be the same arrow for a hairpin a lot of the times. So you, 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 you get on it and you think, okay, just a corner and all of a sudden, whoa, this is a lot tighter than that, you know? Like in Australia, we'll have a hairpin sign. It'll also have a, 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 an, uh, what sort of speed you should be going. So you can always tell how dramatic the, turn, the corner is going to be by the speed indicator, whether it says 30, 30, 40, 50, 20, 10, you know. There we go. gas a bit through a town but every every time you went around a corner you just had more views the, the the drop down on the left was quite quite big I can guarantee you I don't know if we can get a little bit of a look at it at some stage but yeah you can see now but if you just like I'm smiling under the under the visor It's such a beautiful thing riding through this. We took that one a bit wide. It's the bus. Buses are going to be your biggest concern on your whole trip uh, on this and just being very wary of them because they just don't care. So this is going through some of these dried up towns. Obviously not a lot of rain in these sort of towns. And a lot of these sort of shops and all that are all shuttered up and, you know, it's a little bit sad. That's just the place where I stopped off. You can see my bike all loaded up there. See, a lot of the towns have these little squares through them. Even small towns will have this sort of square and they're really good to just be able to sit down and lay down in the grass under a shady tree and relax. But on I go, and I've got more of these deserts to get through. Mountain ranges. It is just spectacular driving. The thing is, once your tyres get really worn, you, you you can really, you know, like wear a worn in for the day, I should say. Once they get warm, uh, you can really, you know, be a little bit more aggressive in the turns than normal. Just got to make sure you've got the bike set up correctly, the weight's evenly distributed.
and you just don't overdo it. I mean, that's a problem with, you know, the few of the accidents I saw were just people doing things they didn't need to do. Lots of animals on the road as well, just wandering around. I really didn't, I mean, this day, you know, you get some days that are like uh, six or eight hour days and they feel like they're 15 hour days and you get days like today where I actually was on the road for 13 hours and I didn't even, didn't even feel like I, and it was more than, you know, five or six, seven, eight hours. It was just so much fun. You just get so much into the riding. Um, you do realise, you know, when you stop, you realise, okay, geez, I've been on the road now for eight hours and I've still got like five hours to go or whatever, you know, but it's, uh, I could just do this all day long. Um, again, I, the, the really, the, one of the things that really surprised me on the trip was that I just didn't see many other adventure riders. I thought I'd be seeing people all, all the way along the way, you know. You, you see a smattering of them here and there, but even going into towns that you're staying at and going to the coffee shops and walking around, I just didn't see any. Um, you know, you saw local riders and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, it really surprised me. When you get further south, once you get into Patagonia, because there's a lot of tours that just do tours in those places, like um, even Bolivia, there was a few tours going on and people riding through, through there. A lot of people from Brazil. Um, look at that. God, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. So I consider myself very lucky to have experienced this. It was, um, it was, it was a taste of things to come. I had a lot of hard riding days ahead of me, but it was just, you know, you just felt so amazing, you know. And this is where I stopped off. Uh, one of the points. This is before I got to the main desert areas, but it's still pretty barren. And there's a, this was a, a dam, and it was pretty low, to be honest. Um, but it was quite spectacular. Um, and I stopped off here for probably about 15, 20 minutes. It wasn't a, a full stop with, with something to eat. Um, didn't have anywhere to, to rest, but um, just had a bit of a walk around. Spectacular views. Just one of those days you, you just want to keep riding, you know. So you, as, as you can tell now, the, the weather is just completely cleared up and it's just all uh, all hazy, smoky. You know, some burning going off. Uh, it looks like it was controlled burning um, going off in certain places. But yeah, riding down now into, into one of the valleys. As you can see, if you see down below on the right, you'll see how it twists and turns around the around the mountain there. Yeah, sensational. Jeez, I love that. Yeah, this is one of the more spectacular days um, with the mountain ranges. Um, once you get into Patagonia, you get a lot of these sort of days as well. But you, but you're dependent on the weather, on the weather too. Um, the main mode of transport for people living in in these sort of countries is either in the back of a van or back of a, a, a pickup truck, or in um, or in uh, so that those little things there. They're water indentures, so they're basically there for when the water flows across. When there's too much water and the drains can't handle the water just flows across the road and you've got to be really careful over those things because some of them have sitting water and there's a bit of moss build up on them and they can get pretty slippery um you know i went you know you, you probably go through about 100 or 200 of those on your journey and some of them are, are dry and they're fine but some of them are wet and mossy and really slippery there was one of them that was right on a corner and uh <laughs> As soon as I hit it, I thought, geez, you know, no braking, just ride straight through it. And I had to ride a little bit on the other side of the road, uh, so I didn't cha uh, change, change direction. So this was going right down into the valley, and then I followed the valley along 
for maybe 30, 40, 50 miles after this. And then it sort of opened up towards, I'm heading, uh, getting closer and closer to the coast as well by the end of this trip. Because Trujillo is pretty much right on the coast. And a lot of these roads actually had some good stop off points for just having a rest, rest but they didn't have anywhere you could sit or lay down. So you really had to just pick your spots where you wanted to go to. Another one of those indentures in the road. There was no rain around though, so it was pretty dry. Bit of, bit of foliage around here. Yeah, so um, so from Trujillo, uh, I was going to uh, only spend one night in Trujillo and then head to uh, head to Lima in Peru, where I'd spend about four or five days um, and have a look around Lima. Again, big city, beautiful, beautiful, uh, some beautiful areas uh, in in Lima. Um, and then from there, I was going to be heading to Cusco and doing the. Um, doing the ruins, a you know, tour of all the different ruins, including Machu Picchu, uh, which was a spectacular day, but it was very touristy. <laughs> um, but I ended up splurging a little bit on that one. Um, yeah, it was, I just noticed that there wasn't that many trucks on the road. I didn't have to overtake too many trucks. As you can see, they just take up the whole road. They bit their horns whenever there's a, um, they just toot their horn wherever they go around a corner, just to let any other trucks know that they're gonna have a head on. If the other truck does exactly the same thing, which the other truck always, trucks always do, unless they side each other, then one truck will probably stop and let the other one go around, you know. The trucks always go really slow over the tapes because they, they're doing it every day and, and they obviously see the damage those sort of things cause if you go too fast over them and they're, they're, they run on pretty slim budgets so they don't want to have any damage to their trucks at all. But you're always seeing trucks on the side of the road with punctured tyres. And... I had one blowout near me and I got hit by a bit of rubber, um, like only a tiny fragment. Um, I'm pretty sure that was back further, that was on a highway in, in the US. I forgot to mention that in the video, in one of the previous videos actually. And as, it, as everything in the US, everything gets shut down and you know closed off and stuff like that is so, so ridiculous in the US that, that you know in Peru, but, you know I mean even in Ecuador, Colombia sorry I think it was where the, that kid died, I mean they cleared the road in 20 minutes. It was like, okay, this happens all the time. Get, put the body on the, in the back of a van, put the bike on the back of a truck, take a couple of photos of the, of the spot. And honestly, they were taking it with their camera phones. Um, their, their phone camera, sorry. Uh, just crazy. And then, you know, five minutes later, everyone's driving crazy the same way again. Now, it's, uh, it's something you, you, you get a little bit shocked by, but you get used to it, you know. Trying to think of now where I stayed in Trujillo. I st actually I stayed at a, a a decent sort of place in Trujillo. It was it was okay. And I think I've written about it in my blog post. So with 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 my blog post that go alongside these videos, I sort of detail a little bit about the ride, where I go through, where I stay, and a little bit about the the destination city uh, that I usually just lift from Wikipedia. Um, you know, if I know, I got there at like 7 p.m., so I didn't really get a chance to have a look around the city. I went for a ride at night, uh, to fill up the bike. Um, I'm pretty sure I went, yeah, if I went to fill up the bike, and then I um, uh, just had a little bit of a tour around the city, got a bite to eat, had a bit of a walk around, and then headed back to the hotel and got my uh, got my rest.
I didn't want this to end, I really didn't. But I was getting towards the end of the mountain road. Well, you know, the mountain range continued, but I ended up going right um, and headed towards the coast. I'd had quite a few weeks in, in, in the Andes, and uh, it was time. The Andes sort of follows it along a little bit, but it's a fair way, probably about you know, 50, 100 miles away, uh, depending on where you are. And uh, you know, I got into you know, the next couple of video segments here are, are into the desert and the towns alongside the desert roads. Had a fair bit of fair bit of sand blowing as well. And some military police. You see military police all all the way through. Uh, Chile and Argentina not so much, um, but there's plenty of police around. Um, but you don't see the military anywhere near as much as what you see the military in Colombia, even in Central America, the military are everywhere, um, exception of Costa Rica, obviously. Um, but you know, I, I never had any issues with any of them. You know, Colombia, we got into in, in Cartagena, we got into a bit of trouble because we're riding our bikes through the old town, but we weren't allowed to ride there. But they ended up taking us on a little bit of a tour to cut through the whole town instead of just where, where the, we were, we'd just entered the old town. They couldn't just tell us to go back the other way, but they said they escort us through. So we ended up having a ride through the old town, which was cool at night too. Um, and yeah, Colombia was the only time I experienced anything negative about the military police. And that's because they just wanted to stop us all the time for no reason, you know. They just wanted to stop and, you know, usually had to wait 30, 45 minutes because they call in somebody else, um, you know. Or we, or at one stage, we parked our motorbikes on the footpath where, where there was other bikes parked. And here's the desert, and they, and they pulled us. They they took 30, 45 minutes before we were allowed to leave. But they, we didn't get into any trouble or anything. They just started talking to us and then telling us, uh, calling in other military people, and then, okay, you can go. You know, it's so silly. Pretty dry and barren in these places, hey? There's one thing you're going to notice as you go through towns is the uh, is the amount of rubbish in towns. Uh, Central America just shocked me. Just the amount of rubbish dumped on the side of the roads. Um, you don't see it as you're driving through the country as much, but um, in the cities or anywhere around towns. So this is actually getting to my, uh, getting to the place I was staying. Uh, I took a little side road, took a little side route, uh, and went through. Yeah, just as, again, if you can, whenever you get into a country, get get a really good detailed road map, like a paper map, and then you could sort of work out where you're going to get to. And I'd mark it on my GPS. I'd mark where my turn off was going to be on my phone, and then hit that road and and cut through. Most of the time you didn't have a problem, but you always saw something different. Sometimes got a bit of surprise with some dirt tracks and, and then uh, sometimes also got even more surprised by there being a gate on a public road, uh, but that was for the farmers to lock in. Most of them were locked, unfortunately, for me, and there was only once I had to wait quite a while before I could get through there. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So yeah, once I got into Trujillo, um, I, uh, I'm trying to think, I, I don't know whether I stayed one, one or two nights. Um, the place was called the Wyndham Costa del Sol. I think I actually stayed two nights there because uh, I got there so late at night um, and I wanted to have a look around the town and the, and the area. So I think I decided to, to stay there a little bit uh, for an extra night. The hotel was fine, internet was terrible as usual, and this is coming into the town now. So all, a lot of the hotels in these towns are, are walled off, so that you actually cannot uh, you cannot get in there unless you you're actually uh, a, 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 an employee or you uh, you. Uh, you're a guest. These are some final shots of the trip. So yeah guys, uh, as always, uh, questions and comments below. Happy to answer any of them. 
Uh, I hope you're having a, a, a great day.